Thank you for the question. Actually, a lot of my work is about uh, that, more precisely algorithmic sovereignty, since I uh, do software, so I don't do hardware. And my uh, opinion here is mostly focused at the software part, so at the digital part, at the code that runs on the machine, and not at how the machine itself is done. So technological sovereignty is a, is a wider uh, topic. Uh, what I really have expertise on is software. And in case of software, it's extremely important because software changes even faster than machines. For instance, um, we all use these social networks. The most famous in the West is Facebook. And we use Facebook uh, despite it changes constantly its rules, but we don't vote about them. We don't have a say about them. It's the company that decides how the rules of the games are going. So basically this brings to a problem of sovereignty because we cannot actually govern the place where we live, at least on the basic uh, social contract level that we need to establish. When you, when you live in a city, you actually uh, sign this contract by signing up yourself to the city hall, by paying your taxes, by introducing yourself to the neighbors. And we are left in this sort of uh, scenarios into a project, projects like situations in which uh, uh, we can only get to know our neighbors and we are watched while we are doing that and the conditions by which we can knock at each other door and by which someone can watch us are not decided by us. We cannot even vote about that. So this brings a little bit, I hope, a vision of what is technological sovereignty in a software world. Because software sounds very abstract, but it's actually an architecture. It depends how, from how it works, it depends if you can talk privately with a person or one to many group, or, or you can have a conversation between people, or you can decide that everyone talks uh, two minutes each. Or you can decide that when uh, uh, the majority around you uh, makes uh, uh, this sign, then you have to stop and take a break and make someone else talk. These are decisions that can be implemented in software. And uh, to take these decisions, to invent new uh, schemes, new architectures, is a very important thing that cannot be left only to one player, only to the owner of the game. There should be no owner of the social game. We should all be owners. So, first of all, the Internet of Things is uh, an industrial scenario which is quite overwhelming as of the marketing narrative that has brought it to us. And it's real, actually. A lot of the things that we are going to get into our home can have a very small chip hidden somewhere, declared of course, that connects them to the internet. And this connection can happen without us telling them to do so. This is a big change in the last five years. Things open contexts without us asking them to. So your phone, for instance, will check your email or your connection to a service without you telling it. Do it now. So we lost control of actually how things communicate and open contexts, yet they do gather our data. So they have data about us, they know our, our fridge will know how much grocery we have and when we have to go to the, to the supermarket and we'll be able to communicate to the supermarket our behavior. And we'll start doing that without us <coughs> choosing. So you understand this is a very dangerous scenario for privacy but also it will be a complete waste of uh, uh, bandwidth and all these things can be hacked and they have been already hacked. So all these things have been uh, introduced uh, malware and all sorts of uh, viruses that already make them act against our will uh, on behalf of people online having other agendas like making uh, whatever they want with these things online. So the scenario is is a, is a very worrying scenario. Now, I don't want people to worry. We all don't like to worry. And actually, we don't need more complexity in our home. Home should be a place where we come back and we actually switch off the work environment, the worries, and we actually relax with our families. So, the project I've been working on in the past uh, three years with a team of uh, really top-notch developers, both in design and hackers, is called DAOs. D-O-W-S-E. 
and we uh, just do it free and open source. Everyone can download it. Uh, we try to make it as possible, uh, as much as possible, accessible to people to buy it under the, the hundred euros uh, cost. And it's a box that you can put between uh, your uh, Wi-Fi network and your ADSL router that can actually switch off the things that you have in the house. So you have a list of things that connect to the home and then you can just say this off, this off, only this on. I want to have um, uh, my fridge offline. I bought a fridge and it has like this online connectivity. I want to be sure it doesn't connect because I don't want to use that feature. Or I have a phone that uh, should not connect to Google to just transfer its data and I want to be sure so I will say off you can connect on the internet but not to Google my PC keeps on connecting to Adobe because Adobe wants to update my PDF reader I don't want that I cannot opt out I go to the, to the router to the DAOs and I say off Adobe my PC will not connect to Adobe anymore and so on and so forth we want to have people in control of their data flows. We don't want to cut them off, but we are looking at awareness as a security model. We don't believe in anxious security. We don't believe in people that is going to look at logs. No one looks at logs. You don't go home and, you know, like make yourself a tea and look at logs on your router. You actually want to know when things happen and take a decision about them and that decision to stay. So we are really making an on-off switch that puts the people at the center of the decision and uh, gives them back the control about the, the data that is flowing at all. Well, you see, um, the blockchain technology really comes from a project which is much more popular. It's just a component of it and it's a project that has uh, um, actually made a lot of headlines all around the world. I'm talking about Bitcoin. The Bitcoin project was born out of a concrete attempt of sovereignty. The moment in which Bitcoin took off, it was around 2011, it was the moment in which uh, Wikileaks had its financial blockade imposed on it. Uh, Assange was uh, releasing uh, actual information, the cables, and uh, that happened uh, to be a problem for some politicians, which called for Mis Visa and MasterCard to shut down the connection to Wikileaks so that people cannot donate to them anymore. When that happened, there was a hacker constituency, a big one, that decided that was the time to start using Bitcoin. Bitcoin was actually a tool for sovereignty in the moment in which it allowed a project to receive support from its own supporters all around the world without the decision that was not really even ruled in a court case. There was no court case that Wikileaks had to have its uh, pipes cut. So there was no democratic process, there was no law process, there was no neutrality. And we need neutrality to shape uh, democracy. We need people that actually speak out loud about what is happening if it's needed, if it's corrupt, and if people need to know. And we cannot shut that down because it would be really bad. I mean, we wouldn't have a system in which we can verify the actual, uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, situation. And we cannot allow people to, to, to talk. So you see, this is a concrete example of sovereignty made possible by a blockchain-based technology, namely the biggest one, Bitcoin. I don't think it makes really sense to talk about uh, blockchain without putting Bitcoin in the picture. But there are uses for this sort of technology that are bound probably to the biggest blockchain in the world that are very interesting and they go beyond the financial layer, beyond sending money from another side to the world to the next. And the role is very simple. It's a ledger, it's a registry, it's a record of timestamps uh, events in time. This happened at that time and everyone knows it and it's recorded. So the blockchain is also interesting because it can be used for more things than money. It is a registry, so it's basically um, a record of things that happen in time at a particular time and everyone knows about these things that have happened at that time. So it can be used also for other things, for instance, for the notaris. I don't know how it's called in uh, Spanish, the notario. The cartorio. Cartorio. It's para 
it's to register your juridical actions, yes. right? Like Notario. stamp, Notario. Notario. Notario, for the Notario. Notario. So you can actually use a blockchain for the Notario. You don't need an authority that is verified in its own actions, his or her own actions, which are supposed to be almost sacred by the state because they are uh, actually pointed in time. You can do it with Bitcoin and you can be cryptographically sure that what is stated and everyone has duplicated in uh, his or her own computer is actually the uh, truth for that blockchain. So as much as I think the, the concept of truth is very problematic and we cannot actually take a blockchain as the record of truth, it is a device that works very well technically against any tampering, any counterfeiting of events in time. And this is what really is, because Bitcoin is just a ledger, a record that says this person sent this money to this person at that time. And every time you want to do a balance, you have to go through all the record. That's why it's a bit slow. You can use it for many other things. And there are many uh, initiatives around uh, using uh, blockchain technologies, perhaps too many. So right now the hype is so big that it's very hard to distinguish between them. But definitely there are some valid ones and actually as far as I know Spain is at the forefront of pioneering on many good implementations. Why do you think so? Well I know for instance ChipChap which is like a very advanced uh, banking uh, system that is being developed here or um, a Fair Coop which is a social uh, initiative uh, that uh, actually struggles to give people sovereignty and has already developed its own coin, fair coin, so it's establishing a way to actually have basic income among its members. So these are like absolutely for, uh, forward uh, looking uh, scenarios and I really admire that the pioneering that is happening here.